folks have asked about uh, rivets and uh, the headlamp over here. Um, if you got to take a look at it, uh, the components uh, that make up the headlamp, the, the door assembly, the jam, the smoke bonnet, uh, the back, and the uh, uh, vent flutes at the bottom are all held on with rivets. And uh, it's great if you've got a, a, a riveting machine that can uh, can install those pieces. I do not. And uh, I expressed this concern to uh, some friends of mine, and they said, "Well, why are you uh, why are you using uh, uh, the conventional riveting?" Okay, say more. Well, uh, if you're going to fasten two pieces together with a, uh, a rivet, typically you have a uh, well, a round rivet, but uh, you have a uh, uh, what's called a bucking bar. That is a uh, a form. Uh, that's, let's say, sitting in a vise, and uh, you'll have a, uh, a mauling tool that's also got the same profile that goes into a, uh, a pneumatic driver. And uh, on brass, you're not heating the, you don't heat the, uh, uh, the rivet to set it. Um, that's great. Those look fantastic. If, uh, if you've got the equipment to do that and you've got the, the, the means to get in and access uh, the, uh, the both sides of the rivet, that's great. On those lamps, that's not happening. And uh, the reason is that uh, uh, you just, you just uh, unless you've got uh, dedicated tooling, uh, you just, uh, you can't put these bulky tools inside uh, of a seven inch diameter like that. Uh, so what I do, uh, what I was uh, told to do, and uh, have, have successfully done is, uh, uh, take your rivet. Uh, you do not need the bucking bar. You do not need the uh, pneumatic driver. Um, place any uh, firm surface against that rivet um, and solder it. Now you've got to do a little bit of preparation to the rivet uh, before and after uh, you set it. But this is, this has got a couple of really neat advantages. One, when you take these parts apart, the, the likelihood that you're going to send your, your drill to, to drill these out uh, right through the original hole, <laughs> not real good. No. At least with me it's not. So uh, the, the openings tend to be a little bit sloppy. Uh, not so sloppy though that the rivet head doesn't cover it. The rivet uh, itself, uh, much like uh, we saw with tinning brass, uh, needs to be abraded a little bit. So this. Uh, this area here um, that's going to uh, contain that solder, we want to chuck that up in a uh, in a Dremel or a drill, and just just uh, kiss it with a file or uh, some emery paper to rough it up. Go ahead and load it uh, into the the, the hole uh, where these plates are going to be fastened. Uh, you're going to put pressure on the stack of plates to force them down against that rivet head. Uh, put flux to it and solder it. Not a lot of flux because you don't want this dribbling down through here and coming out onto your visible uh, brass. Uh, but uh, the benefit is that uh, it's it's ever bit as strong as an original rivet. It's not going to come off until you take it off. Uh, the uh, solder will make its way down and fill up this this void to some degree. And uh, once you have uh, secured that uh, that joint with the uh, solder on the rivet, you can come in here and, and cut that dude off. <laughs> cut it sheared off and then use your Dremel, round it off or grind it off. Uh, nice thing about that is you, if you were looking at uh, uh, that grind under a uh, under, under scope, uh, it actually swedges the brass over the, uh, 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 the solder a little bit. So you got a little bit more of a, of a resistance to the, uh, to the uh, uh, rivet trying to pull its way out. It's not going to release off of that solder under any event, but uh, makes a real nice looking finished job. And uh, as I said, where you've got uh, mismatched holes, you get now you've got a little bit of a, uh, a compensator there that's going to make that a cleaner job. Again, that, uh, that lamp back there is uh, put together um, like so. Um, what I found with the uh, uh, the hinge parts and uh, and, and uh, 
especially on the brown, is that uh, I'm assuming that they use fixtures to drill those parts because the holes are approximately uh, alike, but if you put them side by side, you know, I don't know if they're fixturing uh, moves around or, or what the deal is, but uh, you're going to have to do a little bit of uh, this sort of compensating. And if you've got a really bad situation where, um, you know, this, uh, this boogered up hole here is just obnoxious, you can, uh, you can actually come in here with a, uh, a uh, brass washer thin it down as much as possible so it's not looking conspicuous. Load that brass washer on there before you do your solder and your cut. Yeah. Okay. Questions? Who has the tail end? What do we do? Okay. There's a scrub. Well, there's a piece on here. It's not the original one, but we found one close, and it looks like somebody actually on the inside piece here. See how there's a there's a, a flat gap, and then the threaded pieces underneath. It almost looks like they flipped it over. Now threads are on top, and underneath is this flat piece. So we're not sure if that's what they did, but that's kind of what we. If we can flip this over, this piece will work the best and look the best. Not quite sure what that would entail, but you can see the job that they did was pretty fairly rudimentary there. But we're thinking they may have flipped it over to get the threads on the top side for their purpose. Quite possible. You can see how they're on the bottom side, but if you reach in there, that lip feels like this lip. Yeah, yeah this has definitely been taken apart and uh, I, I would say re-soldered because, you know, an OEM wouldn't, uh, wouldn't leave that that sort of a finish on, on one of the parts. And we're thinking maybe flip that one over because I don't think we can get this one in here. That looks pretty dicey. Looks to me like what is going on here is that this is soldered from the back. The back side. Exactly, exactly. And uh, that's why they did it. Uh, they, they did not have the means to take this back apart. And that's why they did it all from the top. Um, these are uh, two distinctly different fonts. Uh, and this is the one that's more correct. So that's one we're going to try to save, but it'd be nice to get that slip down. Um, I would say there's a fair amount of risk in taking this apart, just not knowing, um, you know, the history of what went on before they put this in. That is, not knowing what you're going to find when you flip that up. Right. But uh, it certainly could be taken off, and I would recommend that uh, that this be wrapped with uh, an insulation, again, a, a wet, wetted towel, wetted cloth, uh, and uh, it. Uh, Assuming that it's not, you know, screwed in there, it uh, should lift right out. But uh, not knowing what we're going to find when we flip it over, uh, be prepared to put it back. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Is that uh, some work that you're uh, interested in? And that's yeah, yeah. If you want, Don can start, or I can do it. Cool. All right. All right. You think that's good? Yeah. 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 We said if we take this one apart and get this one out of the piece, we may not be able to put it down in there. Because we can't solve We had these two horn projects brought in, and uh, this, this one illustrates a, uh, a common issue, one unfortunately fatal issue, is in, in the, the sense that a portion of the, uh, of the retainer for the, the bell front is broken out. And uh, because the bell on this part, uh, the frame of the bell would, would fit internal to this piece. We don't, we don't have a, an easy opportunity to put a patch inside there that we could lay this repair on top of. Um, we could uh, thin a, a, a patch underneath uh, to uh, actually make it work. Um, but the repair is going to be noticeable. And I, I don't think it would be a big deal on this part because you've got this, uh, uh, this fastening screw uh, sort of obscures that area a little bit. Uh, the bottom, you don't see it. Um, so what I'm recommending is that, hold that a second, that we're essentially going to uh, uh, put a, uh, Bell. We're 
going to put a, uh, a patch underneath and then we're going to lay a, uh, call it a spacer on top of that to bring this metal back up to the surface of the original part. And uh, I, would, uh, I would recommend that we uh, attach that with a silver solder just because I, I think it's going to take a fair amount of wear and tear. Um, here again, I, uh, I'd like to try that, uh, that paste, paste. On, on this to see whether uh, um, we could minimize the amount of uh, heat that we're putting into it. Um, as far as uh, reducing the thickness uh, on the brass, we could try putting it together without doing that and then come back later with a Dremel and reduce the thickness. Um, but I'm just just eyeballing it. I'm guessing that uh, another 20 thousandths uh, in two places on that is not going to keep that bell from attaching. I haven't tried to force that in there or, <clears throat> or refit it to it. We could, we could put a, a shim in between the there. Inside. We could uh, lay a shim in there without soldering it just to verify that the, the added thickness doesn't create a problem. Uh, and if, uh, if that's satisfactory, uh, go ahead, solder it in, and uh, uh, there's going to be a fair amount of uh, trim and uh, cleanup work on it once we put that in. Uh, that is, the, the slot for the, uh, the mounting screws will have to be re drilled. And, uh, um, we'll want to do some cleanup work on it uh, so that it's like a polish. A couple of questions. You mentioned silver solder. Uh, what is silver solder? It's silver. Tim, Tim is a, a heating and air guy. I want to defer to him. The silver I was always taught, and it's just what it says, it's, it's a pretty high silver content. Um, it, in refrigeration, you're brazing, you get the choice. You can use uh, Harris, one of the manufacturers, their trade name is Stay Bright, which has, I think, 15%, 20% silver, and they have tiff and, and other alloys in it. And it works real good, takes a lot of pressure, takes a lot of stress, a lot of vibration. But silver will take a lot more vibration and a lot more heat. So, uh, in residential, you just use Stay Bright when you're brazing lines. You get to commercial applications. Uh, you'll go to silver because a lot of refrigeration commercial application you deal with a lot more pressure, a lot more heat, and the last thing you want is somebody's walking cooler going down, so you silver it. Um, silver is a lot, it's, it's, it's a gem to work with once you've done it once or twice. When it melts, it flows like water. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I love brazing with silver. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it works really, really well to braze with. Um, if you've never brazed before, the only thing that gets people paranoid is you just, uh, here again, I speak on refrigeration, is they teach you to get your part of cherry red before you can put the silver on it. And when you see the cherry red, you slap the silver on it, and it'll just wick out <laughs> as soon as you touch it. Yeah. Pull the heat off. And as soon as the cherry red goes away, it's already set. It, it's, a, it's a dream to work with. It's really, really nice to work with. But it's not cheap. Um, you know, because you're, you're fighting cost in a really nice market anyway. So you just don't use silver. Rio Grande is a better place to buy that. Yeah. <laughs> and you can buy it by yeah. short, small amounts. You don't yeah. have to buy a pound of stuff. Right? Yeah. We also brought with us a, uh, uh, a product by Rio Grande. Uh, so one of Harris's competitors uh, that's a uh, gold tone silver solder and it, it, I've heard about this for the longest time I've never used this stuff and I just did a couple of uh, uh, quickie uh, uh, tests with it before I brought the stuff up uh, what I noticed and it, Tim you, you would agree that you, you're going to put a whole lot more heat not only into your parent part but also into that solder yes. to get that get that uh, seal to happen and, and what uh, I see happening with the uh, the Rio Grande uh, gold uh, is it, it has kind of a like a cauliflower uh, sort of uh, texture to it once it lays down. It doesn't it doesn't puddle, and uh, that whether that's a good thing or bad thing or indifferent, I don't know. Um, what I did with uh, the sample that I did was uh, I simply uh, went ahead and uh, put the uh, put solder. Uh, blob in there and I came back and, uh, and ground it 
I ground it down with a uh, with an emery cloth and uh, progressively got that down to where I could uh, I could go at it with this buffer and uh, uh, not unlike other solder um, the buffer will gnaw that uh, that solder right back out of the joint mm -hmm. if uh, if you lay into it you know you're uh, when you're when you're polishing uh, something that's been sanded I you can get it down to uh, the, uh, the grid of your paper down to 1,000 and you're still going to have uh, scoring in there that you're going to have to come back and, and work out with that buffer. And the buffer generates heat, uh, the solder is softer, naturally it's going gonna, it's gonna to try to take the solder back out. It doesn't do that on the silver side. Right? It, does. it does. It does. Yeah, it takes longer, but it's going to do it. And then the other attribute of the uh, of the gold solder that I noticed is it. Oh, it should be. Uh, there, there's nothing really uh, obvious about this that would tell you that that's going to uh, melt out at uh, at a yellow uh, tone. And it's not really a yellow tone. It's a uh, it's lighter than brass, in my opinion. But what is going to happen also is that as your uh, um, your material, uh, we'll say it's a lamp, tarnishes, uh, you get more intense yellow as it tarnishes, that, that solder is not going to tarnish proportional with it. So that, that repair, uh, you know, if it's structural, it's, it's there doing the job, but aesthetically, uh, it may look like a, you know, a quality repair, which for me is good enough. But uh, uh, somebody who's uh, working a, a concourse project uh, may have a problem with that. Yes, sir. Another question uh, on your proposed repair here. Uh, you were going to put a, it looks like you're going to put a, a piece underneath mm -hmm. and then add a piece on top. Yes. That's the piece yeah, would it, does it make any sense to fabricate a piece, uh, kind of a T-shaped piece, and then roll the Roll it, roll it over. Roll this guy up and over. Yeah. Uh, only that uh, you got a cut edge here, and it's it's where it's visible. Um, if it had solder under it, you might want to roll it over, go ahead and assemble it, and then come back and grind that off, face it off, uh, mm -hmm. so that you've got a, a flat edge showing on the upper repair part. Yes, sir. Would you consider? Being as that's the top and the most visible part of the horn, rotating the bell 180 degrees so that's at the bottom? Uh, you have the same it's broken at the bottom, bottom also. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, to answer your question, if it wasn't, or, or to paraphrase, if, uh, if it wasn't broken at the bottom, that's exactly what I'd do. <laughs> yeah. Maybe even leave it broken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody would have Somebody's going to crawl up underneath there very good for them. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of folks brought horns in. I'm going to talk about those for a second. All right then, much like the, uh, much like the lamps, uh, uh, the horn is just about uh, infinitely restorable. Uh, the same wall thickness brass. Uh, components are simple soldered together with plumbing solder. Uh, very easy to take apart. Uh, for the, the same reason that we isolated pieces of the, the lamps, um, if we needed to take, uh, let's say, a couple sections loose and we wanted to protect other portions of the lamp, we do it with the wet rag. Works great. Um, these, uh, these parts are, are, are uh, from what I can tell, are, are somewhat standardized. You know, they, uh, uh, Ford was using, for instance, in, uh, in 1912, the uh, standard, the roots, and the non-parel horn that, uh, that looked like this after June. Uh, they're, they're an identical lamp. Uh, other than the uh, stamping with manufacturer's name or supplier, whatever they are, uh, those parts are identical. That is, if you've got a, uh, a lower piece uh, that's boogered up to the point where you decided that you just can't fix it and you, and you found one where the top is trashed on another, could fasten those together and and strangely these double twist parts they fit that lamp uh, so I'm not really clear as to what exactly was going on there was there like a, uh, a clearinghouse for lamp parts that these guys went to to buy uh, 
you know, part A, part D, uh, you know, bill number six, whatever, and uh, and then stamp their name on it. It seems really conspicuous to me that the, uh, uh, the ferrules that hold them together are designed uh, identical. Again, if uh, your uh, your part is damaged to the point where you're just going to spend a ton of time on it uh, or, or a piece of it, you may very well want to just go and, uh, and and look at eBay and say, hey, you know, here's one that's uh, got usable pieces where the rest of it's trash. Susan. So is, is the term Rube a brand? Or is that a part of the horn? That's a company. Rube is, is a brand. And Rube's. A company that made R U B E S. Okay. Uh, non Perel uh, is, for all intents and purposes, an identical horn. Uh, and then standard. Uh, from what I could tell, between mid 1912 and uh, 1916, the Ford used a, a, a horn that looked like this. With, with varying mounting uh, brackets. This is a uh, mid-1912 to uh, through 1913 where the mounting bracket is round. Uh, supposedly uh, the, the oval shaped piece, and I say supposedly because I, I don't think the documentation exists, it says proof positive that these, these were used in the sequence that are, that are believed to, but uh, I have to have to believe that uh, you know some of the uh, uh, Stallworth fathers of the Model T that, that research this stuff have good reasons to believe what they believe. Uh, the, the 13 uh, uh, had this round mounting. The 14 had a, a, uh, an elliptical mounting. Uh, again, uh, cast iron like this guy. And uh, from uh, the remainder of 14, late 14 uh, through 16, they had a diamond shape. And supposedly the, the diamond shaped bracket uh, is, is designed to uh, offer clearance where it's mounted under the hood instead of outside. But uh, any one of these horns looks just like this guy other than the mounting. And if you have a, uh, let's say a, a 1913 that uh, like I do, that I think belongs to this car and the rest of the horn is just completely trashed, I'd have no problem with going out and uh, scavenging these parts from a later horn, and once they're put together, absolutely nobody would ever know that uh, the, the provenance of those pieces. Again, the, the, put a set of uh, calipers on them, and they're they're, they're identical. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, parts that are uh, beyond the point of uh, reasonable return. Uh, if somebody had come to me with this part. Um, uh, and, and suggested that they were going to send it out to a shop to have it restored, I just said, absolutely not. They will scald you. Um, i got 12 hours in this dude, and it's probably going to take me another four to finish it. And uh, I don't know what a shop gets for that kind of work, but uh, it's above my pay grade. Uh, so you have 16 or 20 hours in it $35 now? Yeah. <laughs> Makes me say, ouch. It's <laughs> just, just crazy. It's crazy. Uh, this one, uh, I didn't put on the car when I restored it because it needed so much work. I had a, uh, uh, the one that's on there now has got the uh, elliptical base on it and I put it on there. Uh, I, uh, I did not paint the horn. This, uh, this horn will be uh, uh, painted black with the exception of the, the bezel and the screen in the front. Mm -hmm. That's, as far as I can tell, the way they came. Bruce McCauley uh, said that uh, in uh, early uh, production of these, which would have been the mid model, uh, mid 1912 model year, uh, that these uh, single twist horns were all uh, brass originally. Uh, I've looked at a lot of old photographs of, of original 1912 cars, and I don't think I've seen one that, that definitely looks like it's a brass horn. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say they painted this dude. Uh, the, uh, the uh, steel uh, uh, base or iron base also uh, would lead me to believe that uh, because it was not brass plated, it was probably painted with the horn. How much that polish is on that horn? How it much? Was done, so, by, was done by hand, and how much on the bucket? Uh, this this was just wiped down with polish. So most of this. Done by hand. Yeah, if you look at this closely, there, there's scuffs all over this thing. 
Uh, I think that looked pretty nice. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I mean, take, take a real close look at it. It's got, uh, it's got a, uh, it's got more than its share. How do you get it? You yeah, how do you get it in those cracks? Those, those are polished while they're affordable. You took it apart, you yeah. polish it, and you put it back I had, I had pulled that side out. There's something to buy. Can you talk about the water now? Yes, really. I really can't. It's better than a double more. So, I think it's a really tight place. You can see the scraps. Because the. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, the, the, the less costly polishes have a, uh, a, a more gritty pumice in them, you, you can never achieve that, that mirror finish that a, a, a show shine is going to offer you. That is, uh, you can take a piece of, uh, of brass and, and polish it with brass, brass until the cows come home, and it's always going to have that, uh, that like angel hair, uh, like hairline. Uh, Oh. Like etching, you mean almost? Or, yeah, uh -huh. etching, exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I started looking for better quality. Uh, uh, and it, it's on the back. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, I went to a, uh, a lamp shop in Cincinnati. Uh, these guys do uh, like uh, restoration chandeliers, uh, and uh, they said, "Well, yeah, we, we know exactly what you're talking about. And this is what you need." And uh, I think somebody just looked uh, up online. This is like 41 bucks on Amazon. It's got a price tag on $4. Okay. Uh, 41 bucks on Amazon delivered to your door. Yeah. Uh, two days. I, I've made this can last uh, going on two years. I'm, I'm halfway through it. And that's uh, three cars that I've, uh, I've done work with. These, uh, with that. Uh, I like it a lot. And, uh, uh, it's a testament to its quality, the uh, uh, superior finish that that stuff lays down. Um, and I'll show you here on the uh, photos of, that I've got. I've got a, a set of uh, Apple Castle uh, side lamps where the, uh, uh, the reflectors on the inside uh, were silvered originally, but, but somebody had aggressively cleaned it and they had they cleaned the silver right down to the brass. So it was all splotchy looking. And so, uh, it took a lot of time uh, and, and it very complicated by hand because you know you, you just can't get in there easily. But uh, uh, I used this product and, and, and put a mirror finish on the inside of these lamps that is just off the chart. Uh, I'm very very satisfied with it, as I said. And uh, longevity wise, it, it appears to hold up fairly well. Um, the, the 12 that I've got across the street over here was polished uh, before the car was brought up here. Was it a year? A year ago? Uh, it's still holding up pretty nice. Uh, what uh, what will obscure that finish though is uh, somebody puts their hand on it. I, I guess it's the acid uh, and the oil off of your skin. Uh, you won't see it immediately, but two weeks later, brother, you'll see a spot on there. And if you leave it on there, it'll just keep getting darker and darker. And when you go to take it off, uh, you'll work hard to get it off. Harder and harder. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like a water spot, you know. It just uh, there's no way, there's no kind of seat where you can put on to prevent that. Well, uh, I, there's been a lot of discussion about lacquer. And, uh, oh God! Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. We're, we're all we're all on the uh, same page on that. Uh, I, I was uh, I, just for the hell of it, I, I thought I'd try. It. And uh, I, I did a, a set of side lamps and a tail lamp that were on my town car in, in lacquer. And uh, I used Helmsman uh, Glossy, and I, I did everything by the book. I went to see a buddy of mine who was a professional polisher uh, in St. Bernard in Cincinnati. He said, you know, you put that wicked shine on there and then wipe this thing down with acetone. Get all of that, uh, uh, that slip agent that, that, that comes out of these, uh, these products off of there because that will make your, your lacquer uh, orange peel. And the orange, orange peel gives you that... Uh, it, it's kind of, just kind of cloudy. It doesn't look bad, but it doesn't look. It yeah, doesn't like look it's, like a. Uh, to slide away from whatever that material is. Right, right. And so I put that on there, and uh, my my garage is not heated, and so my cars uh, sat out in the barn over winter time, and uh, there's there's some condensation that goes on in there, and yada yada yada. Uh, but uh, long story made short, uh, after about a year, uh, these parts started to develop a. Uh, uh, more, kind of a holographic, uh, oily uh, sort of uh, rainbow at, in certain light type of look. 
and what was happening was that according to the uh, to the folks at this uh, this uh, shop that I got the polish from, is that lacquer is hygroscopic. Uh, water goes right through it, and the, uh, the the saving grace of it is that it repels water, uh, unless you know you got a whole lot of water or you got a, an area where you know parts aren't drying out fairly rapidly, like like my dark garage in the winter time. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well. I did not do that right, and uh, the guy that uh, had recommended it to me said, uh, you know, if you don't like this, just wipe it down with acetone and wipe it right off. Uh -huh. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> not happening. No, no, no. You stick it in a tank of acetone and you might be able to wipe it off two days later, but uh, yeah. it was just a bear to get it back off again, so never do that. Uh, uh, the stuff works great on interior. Uh, I've got a, a, a Victorian house in Cincinnati where we've got chandelier pieces and whatever that we did in uh, uh, a lacquer. Looks just beautiful. Yeah, inside the house, you're fine. It's climate control. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a fellow that told me a lot of fellow that does use lacquer. And then I've got six pages on it from him. He used to do these high dollar cars for high money. The best place. Not model two. He said you use an English lacquer, and he gives you the name of it, and you bake it on. I don't, I don't think I, don't I would put bake parts it. like that in an oven. No, no, you, you got to watch the temperature. <laughs> yeah. okay. Anyway, you want to try it, I'll send you everybody in here these articles. <laughs> I'm going to keep polishing it. <laughs> well, I understand. I've learned the hard way. But he said that he'll guarantee the shine for 15 years. Mm. And he even shows, tells you how to make the oven. And the oven's made out of plywood. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying the worst that I've done. Mm -hmm. But if you try it and tell me. <laughs> <laughs> If anybody yeah. wants that, I'll get it to everybody. It doesn't matter. I'll send it to the museum and they can send it all out. They got on here. I've well, seen a lot of the lacquered brass, but I've seen it on, you know, $150,000 plus cars that stay in climate controlled facilities. Yeah. So and even if they do go on a tour, which most of them don't, when it rains, they stay in the trailer. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I don't mind going at the, uh, the brass on one of these cars once a year. To me, that's reasonable. In, in fact, I kind of enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't want to do two of them one after the other. <laughs> what, what I found, I, I use a product called Prism. And I've tried several different products, but I always end up the last time I go over it is with Prism. Prism kind of leaves. Uh, I don't know if it's an invisible film or something. It, it stays shinier longer with that than it does some of these other products. Uh, and, and what you have there may do the same thing. It this just, this this is the stuff that I've been using uh, on the uh, on the two T's. Uh, as uh, Susan was saying, I, I've had this one over here for a year, um, and I've got a uh, a year on a shine uh, uh, on the town car that's up at Piquette, and. Uh, it does hold up pretty good. The only negative that I've seen, like on this lamp over here, uh, there's a palm print on there, and can't blame that on the on the, the product. Well, I, I know what you mean about the palm print. When we got the white torpedo across the road, they pushed that in and there's Justin in here. <laughs> <laughs> Justin put his head on the top of that respirator and pushed it in. And, and the hand, hand print stayed there for a while, didn't it, Justin? Yeah. And finally, I brought some prism in. We had, I worked at it, but we got busted at it. But it, it, I mean, it was down there. It's kind of like what Amphreeze does the brass. I mean, it just, you really got to work at it. It's like it's off. pitted. Yeah, it's, it's there. So. People don't just realize it. Just putting your hand on stuff while it does that. Yeah. Yeah. This uh, this double twist horn here. I'm a uh, I'm, I'm building. I built this for my my 09. Uh, this is a this is a non-stamped part. So anybody's guess who uh, who Ford got it from, uh, or if it even came off of Ford at all. Actually, when I got this, it was uh, nickel plated, and it was a right-hand horn. 
And what I've done here is uh, I completely disassembled it and I reassembled it as a left hand. And uh, it is absolutely identical to uh, this configuration of horn that uh, I've seen on the O9s. So, uh, a uh, very affordable part of uh, folks who follow the forum. Uh, a guy named Dan Kraft is like the, uh, the horn master and the uh, uh, lamp master. He's uh, the go-to guy for uh, for used brass parts. He hooked me up with this for a couple hundred bucks. And it was really in pretty good shape. It had a couple of dents in it that, that came out real nice. And it needed a screen. But uh, uh, very satisfactory uh, that I was able to uh, put together a uh, a nice looking piece like this for uh, uh, what I think a, a very economical investment. Now the differences in the twist other than the years, but was there a difference in the pitch of the horn based on how many or not? I don't know. I don't know. They, they all sound like a sick duck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, if you're going to rely on this thing to, to keep somebody from hitting you, you're already dead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but they're, they're, they're just beautiful. Uh, something I should note on these, uh, both of these have uh, the uh, vendor's modern fitment on them. And the vendor's modern fitment goes with the, the vendor's modern adapter. If you buy their adapter and try to put it on an original horn, the threads don't fit. Mm -hmm. now, I'm not sure where somebody got off with this, but uh, uh, these modern uh, fitments have got uh, internal threads where you can uh, thread the, uh, the reed in, where the originals are tapered. And uh, I, I, I just, I'm not seeing what the motivation for uh, uh, changing this was, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunate. Uh, I would say I've got, uh, I've got these original pieces, they're in beautiful shape, but I can't, I can't buy the, uh, the attachment for the, for the hose that fits them. But, uh, Fairly easy to, to go ahead and change out. One thing I did notice though is that the bore on this part is not sized for the horn. On either one of these and on my other car, they're, they're uh, undersized. So you've got you to chase a, a drill through there to get, the, get it large enough that it's gonna fit on the horn. Not sure what the uh, reasoning for that might be other than uh, the possibility that they knew that there was variations. Uh, variation in the diameter where they attached. Uh, vendor uh, provided screen. Uh, I don't know what the micron on this is, but just a really good looking product. I think I got this from Langs. Uh, very affordable, very easy to put in. Uh, you see a number of them where the, where the screen is kind of baggy. And uh, I think the reasoning for that is that uh, you actually have to stretch the screen a little bit as you, you install it. So if you're tacking on this side and uh, you've got this thing laying down with a uh, 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 right angle over here to put a little bit of uh, pull on the screen, um, you do a uh, uh, tinning job on the inside. That is that, uh, that, that spot of solder that's going to hold this on here is, is actually tinned. Uh, put a little bit of tension against it to stretch it, hold it, body solder it, and uh, it'll look. It'll sit down on there real nice and flush. Yes, sir. The screen there, if you polish that screen and try to bring it back, what's the best way to keep it on the plot, on the plot of the screen? Um, I use a, an almost dry polish rag first off. If you put uh, uh, a heavy load of polish on there and wipe it on here, you will never get it off. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so. Uh, yeah, just uh, you know, as you're polishing, and uh, where you would normally be ready to grab another uh, squat of goop, go ahead and use that towel. Uh, I don't think you're going to get a real high shine out of that, no matter what you do with it. But uh, that's not really what I was looking for. I just want a uniform. Scott, I don't know uh, how accurate I am with any of this, but the guy I got this car from used to let the local plating shop put clear coat on his brass when he had them polish it. This may have been clear coated and then we put heat to it. So I don't know if this is from the flux or from heating up the clear coat right there, but that might let you know what happens if you heat clear coat, I'm not sure. 
Well, like I said, acetone will uh, absolutely uh, <laughs> 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 take that out. <laughs> That's a good job on fingernails, too. <laughs> Susan, can I get a fire up the computer over here? I just took a couple of uh, a couple of photos of some uh, pieces in progress. I, and I'm sure you guys have noticed uh, the uh, the earlier parts have got uh, like uh, cartouche components on some of them. Uh, this this happens to be a uh, a set of uh, Atwood Castle lamps. And if you if you look at the uh, the reflector in the back, uh, these these were a non-restored set that somebody polished up before I got them. Uh, they were kind enough not to uh, not to take these uh, uh, reflectors, which are which are nice. They're not perfect, but uh, had they uh, taken those out and had them uh, uh, resilvered, that cartouche uh, has the Atwood Castle monogram on it, and I, I've never seen another set of '84s that, that still had those pieces. So I, I really appreciated the fact that somebody was uh, uh, conscientious about uh, about saving that. Tail lamp door that uh, uh, somebody had uh, opened a garage door into and uh, put a, uh, a pretty nasty smush on there. Um, we talked about um, using forms uh, like the, the, the Bondo um, mold as a dolly. Uh, I did something a little bit different here. Actually, I took a piece of uh, copper uh, water pipe and uh, and made a, a, an internal forming tool. Long story made short, I took a piece of uh, uh, inch and a half diameter copper pipe, smashed one end of it, and then formed it to the contour. It was like a bench. Yeah, that's your torch. Yeah, exactly. Find the torch. Ah. Ah. Yes. Okay. And uh, stuck that dude in a vise, laid that door on top of it, and uh, using the plastic hammer uh, force that uh, that smushed corner uh, back out to its original position uh, which established maybe a 80% recovery of the part almost immediately and uh, was just a, a large step forward in, in getting the, the piece ultimately straightened back out. Again, I wanted to stress the, uh, the importance of, of working the brass as little as you absolutely have to. Uh, it's just you know, 100 years old, and, and who knows what's been done to it before it was damaged. The uh, horn that was a uh, right hand made into a left hand, if the photograph it survived. <laughs> uh, I mentioned that this thing had been nickel plated. Uh, so the buffer will take a uh, nickel plate off. Uh, you'll, you'll be there working at it for a while. And what I found was that uh, I went to a, a shop uh, downtown Cincinnati that did industrial crime. <clears throat> and they uh, they strip parts before they uh, they apply their product, and uh, they said bring it down here for thirty bucks. Uh, they took my parts, stuck them in a tank for a week, and when I got them back, they were absolutely spotless. All of the all of the nickel had been taken off. Money well spent. Thirty bucks to save all of that time and headache and the possibility that I'd wind up singing one across the room because of the widow maker over here. That's what that guy looked like on. I got it from uh, Dan Crab. Kind of a handsome little horn. Uh, I don't know if it was original or not, uh, but it was a uh, it was a uh, was in pretty decent shape and uh, uh, as I said, easily uh, taken apart and made into a Model T usable part. I mentioned earlier that we, uh, my, myself and a West Coast uh, friend, were putting together a mold set. Uh, to make uh, fan blades, and these are what those wound up looking like. Uh, we use the same molding technology that I described earlier uh, to uh, make the two halves. Uh, I'm casting this in ductile iron, uh, which has a uh, uh, pretty smooth surface, a uh, smooth cast surface, uh, and I, I believe that we're going to be able to uh, uh, stamp a fairly accurate uh, early fan blade from that. Probably not something I want to go into production with, but between myself and uh, and Dennis, we'll get the, a fan for each of our cars, and for 150 bucks, uh, uh, I'm, I'm willing to pay. Uh, these are another uh, casting that I produced. 
the parts are gimbals, and uh, they go at the end of the, uh, the poles that come down off the windshield, attach on either side of the radiator, uh, and on the uh, Apparently, on some of the, uh, the Metzger windshields, they had a, like a telescoping uh, job with a, with a slip nut in the middle. Yeah. Uh, they had this gimbal at the end. Uh, I'm going to assume that in uh, 1909, there were probably you know over 50 U.S. auto manufacturers, mm -hmm. and that uh, Metzger was making windshields to fit as many of those potential automobiles as possible. And the way they uh, compensated for the, the angle and pitch of those rods coming down as to use this uh, this gimbal. Um, uh, I, I've never seen a set on a car. Uh, Tim and I were up at the uh, Piquet uh, a couple of months back and uh, and looked at the uh, uh, the 09 collection that they had up there. I think they went four four 09s. None of them had that. Uh, only one of them had the uh, collapsible uh, tubes on it. So you know. This is probably another case where they made a half dozen different varieties of these uh, uh, hardware pieces, depending on what you were buying. Uh, I mentioned using uh, AutoCAD and how valuable it's been to me because uh, there's a whole lot going on in a picture like this uh, that I just can't carry around in my head. And. Uh, so uh, I got to, uh, to where I was manufacturing a, a, a special drive shaft for the 09 and uh, did this layout, uh, did the engineering work on it, and uh, was able to pass these drawings back and forth uh, with a, uh, a shop that, uh, that did boring on the back for the bearing. And uh, uh, again, very, very efficient tool. Um, this, uh, this particular program is called Draft Sight. And if you go online, uh, they, they will let you register, and they give you that program absolutely free. And uh, spend uh, you know, a little bit of time and, and do one project on it, and you'll be a believer if you're not using CAD. You will absolutely love this. Uh, it's, it's so nice to be able to make edits and uh, uh, to check your work. Uh, everything is being put together per scale, uh, so it's, it's still possible to screw up, and I know that well. Uh, but. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, a whole lot more accurate than, than drawing stuff up in a, in a notebook. That's the horn bezel off of the, uh, the single twist over there. Again, very easily, uh, dense, easily popped out uh, using a uh, just stiff piece of steel in a vise. The, the top elbow on that uh, when I started with it, uh, after I worked it down a little bit, you can see it was uh, it was pretty well hit. Uh, again, if I if I didn't have a uh, an emotional attachment to the part being part of this car over here, I would pitch that and go get one that didn't have that mess to work with. It just uh, that's that's probably six hours worth of work uh, to, to correct that, and it's not done yet. And how do you get inside to push those dents out? Those uh, those scraps from my shop. Uh, I've got a uh, piece of rod that's got a, a crooked top on it, and uh, much like you saw with the uh, uh, the lamp back that we're working with over there, uh, putting a uh, a little bit of a, a shine on the surface so that you can see where the tool is actually doing the work, uh, enables you to. Follow it right up to the dent, and you know it's going to take a little bit of extra push when you get to the dent. And it's just uh, trial and error. Just keep at it until you got it to, to where you uh, Your surface is, you know, five, five thousandths maybe uh, low, and uh, I can take that and, uh, and file that down, sand that down, polish that to, to make it look like that. If the part gets damaged again, it's hit. It's, it, it won't survive that again. I suppose they're expensive, but only on the internet have I seen them. Supposedly, instrument makers have different sized balls they put inside. Yeah, yeah, they've got a really slick tool for about 300 bucks that they use for uh, repairing trumpets. 
you know how the trumpet's got the uh, progressive taper. And, and what they do is they, uh, they, they shove this uh, tooling ball uh, on the end of a, what mounts to a come along uh, down into the, uh, to the damaged area. Uh, shove it down so far and then uh, uh, take it back out, change the tooling ball to smaller diameter, progressively smaller diameter. Questions or comments? I've got to run, but I appreciate you coming out. Very nice. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Certainly enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you all.